name is Suafutu. I'm a blogger at floodlightsdaily.com. And if you have not ever checked out the blog, I encourage you to do so after today's program. Floodlightdaily.com is a faith and family blog where you can find uplifting articles for your faith and your family life, your Christian faith and your family life. Today we are doing a session on understanding and overcoming depression. And we'll start by reading a few verses from the book of Psalms chapter 42. And this is a Psalm of the Sons of Korah. And I'll take it from verse three. He says, my tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. And verse five says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. And verse six says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Meza, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. And then it goes on and on. Just for us to know that depression isn't something that just came up. It's a concept that has been with us. And today we want to understand it a bit more. And to help us do that, it's a very able speaker with us in the person of Sena Owusu Gibson. And I'll read out a brief bio about Sena. So our speaker is Sena Owusu Gibson. She's a counseling psychologist with a major in clinical counseling. She works especially in the areas of marriage, mood disorders, and trauma-informed care. She's a trainer of marriage counselors and also a resource person on mental health and related issues. And Senna has a heart for the advancement of the kingdom of God. I got in touch with her through a church that I attended where she was serving with the teens chapel. So that goes to show her heart for the work of God that she makes time for all of this. She's also a wife and a mother. Okay, so Senna, thank you so much for making time to be part of this discussion. Um, I would like you to give us a, a brief background to depression. But before then, I was intrigued by your, your title and your career designation. So if you can kindly help us to understand what mood disorders are and what trauma-informed care is. To Susie and your ministry, I want to thank you for this opportunity. So quickly, what are mood disorders? And like you rightly said, before I even get into that, since this is a religious platform, uh, I'm going to treat this topic not only uh, within theory and uh, professional ethics, but I'm going to go out of that and also um, hit on religion and spirituality because this is a religious platform. So I believe that uh, though we are limited in our practice, uh, in inculcating spirituality in our practice, because this is a religious platform, I'm sure that I have the liberty to do so. Yes, so please, you, you do. Yeah, so if there are any prof other professionals on the platform, uh, indulge kindly, give me that uh, liberty to, to practice my faith here. <laughs> All right. So mood disorders, mood disorders basically has to do with um, the situation where one finds him or herself swing, having mood swings, going between one mood and the other. So one moment you are happy, excited, and all over the place. The next moment, you are sad, down, worried, and all that. So the mood, anything that is termed a mood disorder is anything that pushes 
wishes one or an individual between one mood and the other. So the consistent mood swings. That is what basically a mood disorder is. And it's characterized by certain symptoms. I'm sure that as we go along the line, I will outline all the symptoms. There are various mood disorders. We fall into various classes. And so basically that is what mood disorders are about. When it comes to trauma-informed care, so trauma basically is just anything that happens to us that is beyond our ability to cope. So trauma could be an accident, it could be a death of a loved one suddenly. So anything that takes you, um, maybe hits you so hard, unexpected, and it's out of your ability to cope is something that we refer to as trauma. So providing trauma-informed care means that you would help the individual within that period of time to cope with the situation, with the trauma that has occurred and to um, be able to adjust, adapt to it and live a very functional life. So that is basically what trauma-informed care is, is all about. Okay, that's great, that's great. Now, since our um, we have an internet challenges, I'll just um, plead with everyone, if you could just put your videos off so that we just not straining or stressing the bandwidth. That would exactly. be very good. We could just turn off our videos since the network isn't too stable today. Right. Thank you very much, Senna. Now, can you just help us with some insider understanding on you know, this whole issue of depression? Okay, so I'm not a very uh, I'm not very good at statistics, so I wouldn't try the statistics at all. But what I do know is that uh, depression is very prevalent. If you take the mental health disorders, depression is one of the most prevalent. is the most um, is the one that affects a lot of people a lot, and it's quite um, more frequent. And so, what is it characterized by? So before I try to, mostly what I try to do is before I even go to telling you that, oh, these are the symptoms of depression, people right from the beginning will begin to think, oh, I have this, I have that, I think I am depressed. So I'll outline a few things before I come to the symptoms of depression. And so uh, when it comes to depression, like I said earlier, we are talking about mood disorders here. We are talking about that state where you are in a mood swing. But when it comes to depression, you are just in one state. So you are in a low mood or a depressed mood. Um, so if you're talking about depressed, look at a ball. Take a ball or anything that is bubbly. When you press it down in that state where it is dysfunctional, it is no longer a ball. It's what we can refer to as depressed. So you press it down. I wanted to use the video to demonstrate that unfortunately that is not happening. So if the ball is pushed down and probably air is out of it and it's down there, that is what we can attribute um, depression to. So when it comes to that state, there are changes that are happening. The change is happening either in your thoughts, your affect or your behavior. So with anything that has to do with mental disorders, a change is occurring and that change is either in your thoughts, your affect or your behavior. I want us to note that and keep it at the back of our minds. So, this, so there is a change happening. That change is in your thoughts, your affect or your behavior. Now, what is it? The change is deviance. If we talk about deviance, so there are certain clauses that um, outlines or states whether you have a mental health disorder or you, are, or you have depression. So like I said, I want to outline those and clarify those first before I come to the symptoms that may qualify you to be diagnosed with depression. So we are saying that there are changes that are happening in your thoughts, your affects and your behavior. The change is deviant. Now, when we say something is deviant, it's out of the norm. So, or it's out of the expected. So that means that it's deviant. So for instance, if everyone is supposed to have two arms or five fingers and you have two, is deviant. It deviates from the norm. So that is deviant. The change renders you dysfunctional. So that's the next D. It renders you dysfunctional. That means that it, it, you are unable to function with the change that is happening to your thoughts, to your affects, and your behavior. 
you are unable to function academically, socially, or occupationally. Um, so that's the next one. Then the change causes you distress. So whatever change is happening to you, whatever change is happening in your thoughts, your affect, your behavior, results in causes you distress. Either you or your lovers or friends or people that are around you, it results in distress for them. And then the last one is the duration. There's a time span. So that can qualify that if these changes have gone on for a certain duration, a certain um, time, it's gone on for some weeks, it's gone on for some months, then I can say that I have a disorder. And then maybe the final, um, yes, that's the duration. So I've talked about it being deviant, that is out of the norm. It renders you dysfunctional, meaning that you can do the things that you are doing normally, the things that you will call yourself as being functional, um, like doing when you're functional, you're unable to do that. And that could be in your academics, in your social life, and in your occupational life. And that, so the other one is dangerousness, distress, and then duration. Now, another clause that will write it off as to whether you're having a depression or not is the fact that, one, you're not on any medication. So the change that is happening to your thought, your affect, or your behavior, is it as a result of a medication you are taking? Is it as a result of a medical condition? Because some medical conditions can predispose you to having a change in your thought, a change in your effort, or a change in your behavior. And some uh, medications can also do the same. Or a substance abuse. Is there any substance you are using, like alcohol, like um, any other drug that has not been prescribed? Are the changes in your thought as a result of a substance, then you may not be um, diagnosed of anything like depression or any mental health disorder. All right, so what are the changes that could be happening to your affects, your thoughts, or your behavior, or your emotion? And like we have said, I have said earlier, um, depression has to do with your moods, your emotions. So to qualify for a diagnosis, of depression, I will quickly take us through the symptoms that we should be experiencing. Then bearing in mind where I have come from, the changes, changes in your thought, effort, and behavior, the change is deviance, redens you dysfunctional, causes you distress, uh, dangerousness, and then it has happened for a certain number of time, that's the duration. And so, this affect that I'm going to talk about, this mood, the change that is happening to you in emotionally, are you excessively sad? So in the contents of emotion, depression is characterized by excessive sadness. You are sad, you are down, you are low. You can't explain why you feel that way. There's no reason for feeling sad, but you're just sad. There's no reason for being worried. You're just worried. And then you have lost pleasure in the things that you used to love doing before. If you were the kind that used to love going to the beach to swim or to hang out with friends and all that, you love to cook and all, all of a sudden you realize that you don't love to do that anymore. You have lost interest in the things that you used to really love doing before. That is something you should be paying attention to. And then anger, you have become either, you're getting either more angry and being, irritable little things just set you off before you can tell that you are not like that. So emotionally, that is what is happening to you. Now let's come to your thoughts. So we have come from the emotions to your mood. You are feeling excessive sadness, excessive worry, loss of, loss of pleasure in the things that you used to find pleasure in before. Uh, you are finding yourself getting more angry or more irritable. And then with your thoughts, you have feelings of, you, are, you think, you have guilty thoughts. This consistent thought that I'm guilty for something, I'm guilty for something probably that does not even exist, something you may not have even done, but you just feel guilty. You're just consumed with guilt. And then you feel worthless, hopeless. And I will always add all the lessness and lessness. You have it, you're feeling worthless, you feel hopeless, you feel um, any other what lessness you can think about, you have it. You have trouble concentrating. 
And because of trouble concentrating, you find it difficult making decisions. And then you have suicidal thoughts. You realize that these are within your thoughts. You have tried to put them under your affect, your emotions, your thoughts. Um, in se severe cases, sometimes you may have delusions, meaning that delusions have to do with believing in things that do not exist. You have lost touch with reality. And so you may have delusions, believing that there is some uh, strange being somewhere walking around you or walking somewhere. So you may have just strange beliefs or you have hallucinations that is in severe cases. So this one is mostly characterized as um, depression with psychosis because you are having delusions or you are having hallucinations. Hallucination could be either auditory, that means that you are hearing voices or it could be um, auditory um, visual. Yes, visual hallucination, you are seeing things that do not exist. So you can be in a room with people and you are the only one seeing someone in red dress or red clothes when there's no one there uh, with a red dress or something. So you're having either auditory, you're hearing voices or you're having um, visual or sensory. Sometimes you feel like there's something working on your skin or working within you. And those can, those are in severe cases. That is if the depression is very severe. Behaviorally, so I have come from emotions, I've come from thoughts, now we are on behavior. What are the symptoms uh, that represents or characterize depression when it comes to your behavior. You have changes in your appetite. So with appetite, you are either eating more or eating less. So if you are eating more, automatically you are putting on weight, you are gaining weight. If you are eating less, you are losing weight. So the same person with depression, someone with depression could be growing fat, another person could be growing lean because one may have an increase in appetite, the other person may have a decrease in appetite. Same applies to sleep. When it comes to sleep, you may have changes in your sleep pattern. You could either be sleeping less or sleeping more. So either insomnia or hypersomnia. When it comes to activity level, you may be very low, low on energy. You find it difficult to wake up in the morning to do the things that you normally would wake up to do. So you just, or you have slowed your emotions are slow, something that we call psychomotor retardation. So you realize that your speech has become slow, your movements have become slow. You are just slow in everything you do, which wasn't like that previously. You Sometimes you become more quiet, excessively quiet, something that is quite unusual of you. Or you feel fatigue, you are tired quite often. Again, that goes into not wanting to wake up in bed, get out of bed or do anything. You're just, you could be seated in one corner the whole day for the whole day in a stupor or something, or just looking into the air, doing nothing. And then behaviorally, you could also be withdrawing from people and avoiding people. So when it comes to depression, these are the things that we can characterize or attribute to, um, to depression. Thank you so much, Senna. That was very, very insightful. I mean, giving us the signs and symptoms of depression and helping us to understand what depression is so that at least with this information, we can differentiate mere sadness from depression. Now, how about anxiety and how different is anxiety from depression? Okay, that's a very good one. So, and Anxiety, um, there's something we call comorbidity. Anxiety, it's excessive worry and it goes hand in hand, often with depression. Because if you look at the symptoms that I've outlined, um, if one is beginning to experience changes in their thoughts, their affect and their behavior, that is deviant, that is unlike you. It is not part of you. You would obviously become worried. What is happening to me? Why am I feeling excessively worthless? Why am I feeling excessively hopeless? Why am I suicidal? Why I, have I lost pleasure in the things I used to love doing? And all those other things. So there are questions. And those things are the ones that get people worried because there are changes happening to you. And sometimes you, you can't understand what is happening to you. 
And so you get in a state of worry. And that is, so with worry, you are worried consistently, you are worried, you, again, you lose um, energy, you have some um, physical symptoms because anxiety comes with some, you can you could feel some changes in your body, which you can't attribute to anything. It could not be a sickness or anything. So when you look at anxiety and depression, it's something that we call comorbidity. They go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you too for that clarification. Right. I, I know that we have different kinds of temperaments. I mean, some people yeah. are, you know, sanguine, some are choleric, some are melancholic, some are phlegmatic. Do you think that some temperament types are more predisposed to depression? Certainly, certainly. So research has shown that um, cholerics, cholerics are highly prone to depression. Why? Because of their perfectionistic nature. And so, and so they are so organized, they are perfectionists, they want things, they are goal oriented, they want things done, mostly want to be in control, they want things done their way. And so if the choleric is not able to get things going their way or it's not goal directed because they are goal directed, these symptoms seems to worsen their state. So people, it's been shown that the choleric is more prone to depression and then the melancholic okay. because of their social deficits because melancholics do not relate. Most often they are, um, not that they not relate, let me not uh, muddy the waters. They do relate, but they are very choosy with who they relate to, with their reserve nature. They are more prone to depression than the phlegmatic or the sanguine. All right, all right. And can you also highlight types of depression? Oh, uh, okay. So let me take it from, um, okay, so adolescent, childhood, adolescent to, um, to adulthood. And so there is depression. So we can talk about um, peripartum depression, most, which mostly relates to women. That is what the kind of, so you experience all the symptoms. Um, in my initial clarification, I did mention that there is a duration. So you can say that, oh, once I'm having all these symptoms, uh, or I have one or two of these symptoms, that means I have depression. No, you must have the first two, which is sadness and loss of pleasure, which is, these are the main criteria for being diagnosed of depression. And then five of the other symptoms. Okay, so if someone, um, has um, postpartum or peripartum. Peripartum is the few months or weeks preceding birth delivery when a woman takes it or is pregnant. Uh, that is what happens before delivery. You become anxious, you are sad. You Sometimes they are sad about their body shape. People feel bad about how they look and all that. They feel sad, they feel worried and all that. So that gets them depressed. And people also have this fear about the childbirth, the process of birth and life and death situations. And so those are the things that um, cause uh, predispose people to peripartum depression. And then the postpartum has to do with after delivery, especially for first time mothers. Most of them um, just a thought of, what am I going to do with this baby? I had a client when she gave birth, when the baby starts crying, then she also starts crying because she doesn't know what to do with the baby. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, and then and so apart from that, there is also this thing of um, feeling incompetent. Like, I do not have what it takes to take care of, to handle this baby and all, all the other pressure and activities that comes with being a mother. It gets people into a depressive state. So, but most often that do not uh, last. It's, it's a very mild state of depression. And then the adolescents, the pre uh, menstrual depression are related to menstruation. Again, not knowing what to do and what to expect and all that. Then we have the major depressive disorder, which is mostly the first diagnosis of depression 
when you have had all these symptoms for a period of two weeks, then you have major depressive disorder. The other one that we'll talk about is the persistent depressive disorder. That's you have had it for like two years. You've had these symptoms for consistently for like two years, then we say, okay, you have persistent depressive disorder. The very common one that we all know is the bipolar disorder. So depression, we have unipolar depression and bipolar depression. So with unipolar de depression, you have only depressed mood, which is the depression we talk about. And then with the bipolar, you have the depressed mood and then the elated mood. So initially I was using the ball. So imaginarily, since we don't have the video, if you pick a football or any ball, it's supposed to be filled with air. In its air-filled state, it's bubbly. It's, um, you can bounce it. It's, you just imagine what it is like in that state. That is what the bipolar is. It's like it's active, you feel elated, you, know, and you have some grandiose ideas, you feel so powerful and all that. But in the depressive state, you are so low, you lack um, energy, to, function, you are worthless and all that. So that is the bipolar depression. So it's unipolar and bipolar. That means two ways. So with bipolar, you find your moods alternating between high moments and low moments. But with depression, you are just in one state, consistently with the low state. So, and then we have the seasonal affective disorder. So those are the ones that um, I could uh, offhand talk about. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that for that explanation. So now do you think that depression runs in families? Do you think that it's um it's something that maybe some families um have a predisposition to? Sure, definitely. So when it comes to um, the causes for depression, so I'll dovetail that into the causes of depression. Um, okay. It is a belief that uh, there is a psychological theories, there are the cognitive theories, there are the behavioral theories, and then the biological theories. I wouldn't go through that. This is not a psychology class, so I wouldn't go through all those <laughs> theories. Okay. But um, to go straight to answering your question, depression runs in families. So um, if a parent uh, has ever had depression, the likelihood that the child will have it is very, very high. I think it's, uh, like I said, I'm not very good at statistics, so I don't keep the numbers, you know, but I know that there is, for twin studies, there is this 70% chance or 70 to 75% that if you have two children and one is has depression, the other is likely to have it. And it's not only depression, but it's with all mental um, health issues. And this is why, again, I, I draw a pause before I, I draw a conclusion that having a mental health um, problem or mental health illness is just like having any other illness, like diabetes, like hypertension, like any other ailment you can talk about. And so, and some years back, if you know our culture, uh, families will be the ones to choose a spouse for their daughter or for their son. And why? Because they want to go into the family of the man or the woman to find out whether there is anything like mental health disorder, especially because it runs in families. And so if there is depression, you are likely to have it. If there is schizophrenia, you're likely to have it. And uh, the other causes of depression, apart from it being genetic, it's um, stresses, the stresses of life. So um, it is believed that if you find yourself in stressful situations, negative or uncontrollable situations, like marital relationship problems, financial problems, or bereavement, you just lost a very close loved one, unemployment, serious or any serious medical diagnosis, those are stresses, those are stresses of life and they are likely to get into a depressive state. And then we also have um, the way you think. It is also believed that people's negative thought patterns uh, predisposes them to having 
depression. So you have negative thoughts about yourself. So it may not be even before preceding uh, the diagnosis of depression, you already have this negative thought about yourself. You feel low about yourself. You think you are not fit to be in a certain class or something. You, you, your thoughts are largely negative thoughts and you have the same thoughts about others, about other people and about even the world and environment you live in. People cannot be trusted and all that. You are likely to have it's, it can likely cause you depression because you have your thoughts are largely negative. Um, so those are basic ones that I can I can talk about. It is also believed that some medication, yeah, some medication. I think I mentioned earlier, some medication can result in depression. So those are the side effects of the medications you are on can get you predispose you to having. Depression. I'm very. I'm being very careful not to use the terms that will confuse people. So, permit me. I try to use just basically. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid using predisposed and <laughs> precipitated right. and all that. Yes. Right. So, and uh, so that is that is that is where it is. Right. So what hope is there? I mean, the, the, we've we've had some questions come through our yeah. link, and I know people on this. Zoom session would also like to ask questions. But before we get to the questions, um, what hope is there for people who are going through depression? What's the cure? How is it managed and all that? Okay, this one is, I'll go for the pharmacology and then I'll go for psychotherapy and then I'll go for the spirituality. And sure. on that, yes, on that one, uh, it will be a broken record for me. And so, um, when it comes to managing depression, like I did mention, there are severities. So it depends on how severe your symptoms are, how dysfunctional you are with those things. So you keep those D's that I mentioned earlier in mind. Uh, how the symptoms you're having, how dysfunctional does it render you? If it does happen that you are able to function because you are not sleeping, uh, you can't go to work anymore. Even when you go to work, you can't work and all that. Then you would be forced to be on medication. So we have pharmacology where you are taking mood, either mood stabilizers to stabilize your mood, because like we said, it's a mood disorder. And so you may be put on mood stabilizers. This is where the psychiatrist comes in because psychologists, at least for now, clinical counseling or whatever, we are not, uh, we do not prescribe. And so you would have to work with your psychotherapist to refer you to a psychiatrist and this is where you find a lot of patients struggling with you they tell you i think i'm okay i don't want to go on medication because the misconception is that once you are seeing a psychiatrist that means you are mad yes but in Ghana. That, no you are not mad mental like I, I was saying it's just like diabetes hypertension or any other ailments if you're able to detect it early and treat it early you save yourself the severity. And so uh, there's nothing but seeing a psychiatrist. If someone is sick in their kidney, in their liver, or any part of their being, they can see a doctor and they are fine. They can see a gynecologist. You can equally see a psychiatrist and you are not mad. There's nothing wrong with you. You are just taking good care of your mental health, just like someone is taking care of their kidney or their uh, liver, their heart, or anything, any part of their body. And so you may have to be put on a mood stabilizer if your symptoms are that severe, or antidepressants, or again, in very severe cases, you may have to be put on antipsychotic medications. And then when it comes to psychotherapy, there are various things we do. What we are doing here is part of psychotherapy, psychoeducation, where we educate you on your symptoms, and what you can do with them and how you can manage yourself. And because again, like the Bible says, for lack of knowledge, my people perish. So you need education so that you do not perish 
with the symptoms you are having. Um, another thing we do is CBT, which we call cognitive behavioral therapy. Those are technical terms that I wouldn't talk about. So within psychotherapy, you go through CBT, you can go through uh, IPT, which is the interpersonal therapy. We can take you through some schema focused therapy or muscle. There are so many therapies that you can be taking through. And the thing is, psychotherapy does not seek to treat a diagnosis. We treat symptoms. And so we will look at which symptom um, renders you dysfunctional. There could be one, it's like a key to a door. So if you can treat just one, this particular symptom, maybe the client will find relief. And so when you see a good psychotherapist, they can help you come to a point, identifying what your triggers are, and then or what's the symptom that renders you this, um, disables you or dysfunctional and, and treat that. And then when it comes to faith, I believe in faith. I believe in, so I think before I went off, um, Susie was talking about um, people in the Bible. I think she made reference to Psalm 42, uh, who had, um, um, talking about David and his, the state that he was in. I don't know whether I heard that. But we all know that as Christians or people of faith, at least we have people in the Bible that experience what today we can attribute to depression. So if you take Job, you were told that Job had, in a day had 10 of his children, seven guys and three, laying in front of some say nine, some say 10, dead. All his livestock were dead. He had physical sickness. There were balls all over him. At the state, there was a prayer Job prayed. What did he say? Job, at this point, just asked God to take his life so that he could live. So that was a typical state. Job was suicidal at that point. So he had something we call a mental health disorder at that particular moment in time. And then we talk about David. David is another person in the Bible who, okay, so before I go to David, what did Job do? He built his confidence. He found his confidence in God. And that saved him. So if you are a Christian, like I said, when it comes to management, um, I will sound like a broken record here because I can only um, prescribe what I know works you know, in every instance. And so that is it. David was another person we can... Um, we can identify with when it comes to depression. So if you look at the Psalms, you find David going through different moods where he, one moment he talks about praising God and being on his feet and all up. And the next moment he's talking about crying and weeping and being filled with all sorts of stuff. That is what we can also call he being in a state of depression. Who else can we talk about? Um, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. The book, the whole book of Lamentation chronicles Je Jeremiah's struggles and how he was able to overcome them. So those are typical examples for us in the scriptures. And so when it comes to, you know, finding solutions to depression, like I mentioned, psychoeducation is one. And psychoeducation means getting information about your state. What is it that I'm feeling? How much information do you have about the symptoms you are experiencing? So find, get information about what you're going to uh, seek understanding because I would always tell students, understanding is what makes a difference between an excellent student and a poor student. So the same information is given, but when you have understanding, you are able to make better sense out of whatever it is you are going through. So and seeking, being a part of this, uh, uh, seminar today, it's a way of seeking understanding to be able to help you overcome that challenge. And another thing I'll say is for you to identify, I'll come back to the spirituality aspect, identify your source, the source of your depression, eliminate it. What is the source? What is it that is causing your depression? What are you struggling with? You must be able to identify the source and then find ways of eliminating it. 
Um, the next thing I'll talk about is cultivating supportive relationships because research shows that people who have depression have something we call social deficit skills so that they are unable to relate. They lack relationship um, skills. So you must be able to cultivate relations, supportive relationships. And here I say supportive relationship because there are some relationships that do not help us. They are the rather the ones that pull us into depression state because we are comparing and doing unnecessary analysis and all that. And the next thing I'll talk about is to embark on lifestyle changes. So if it is diabetes or whatever, I will tell you embark on lifestyle changes. And this includes um, changing your thought patterns. You want to find, if you feel worthless or hopeless, you want to ask yourself, what is the evidence of my hopelessness? Am I really hopeless? You want to question the negative thought patterns that you have. So that is a lifestyle that you're embarking on where you want to question your thought processes. You want to question your, some of your beliefs and some of your expectations about life because sometimes it is our expectation of life that puts us um, or stretches us beyond our uh, capabilities. So you want to question your expectations about life. And then you also want to be more optimistic and Jeremiah 29 tells us that he says that he knows the plans that he had for us. They are plans of what of good and not of evil to give us an expected end. So if your thought patterns are negative, this is what you should be using to challenge the thought. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. So if, if you have a sense of worthlessness, ask yourself, what is the evidence? I'm actually worthless or I am positioning myself to think negatively. Another thing I would like to say is for you to have a heart of gratitude because whatever makes you feel hopeless, whatever makes you feel helpless, someone is probably looking for that particular thing. And so if you can do, one some of the things we do in therapy is to ask you to come up with a gratitude list to just begin to list the things in your life that you could be grateful for, not the negatives. So sometimes you find that you ask you, okay, can you list 10 things in life that you are grateful for? You can't. Okay, we bring it down. Can you give me five things that you are grateful for in life? Then two, you realize that there is something in your life that definitely you have to be grateful for, you know? And God isn't that wicked to such an extent that he would not give you it will give you nothing to be grateful for. And if you're a child of God, to overcome depression, I would say eliminate sin from your life because there is something known as guilt that surrounds depression. Guilt gets you depressed. Guilt makes you worry. And so if you want to eliminate depression as a child of God or help yourself cope, you must try to eliminate sin from your life because sin puts you in a state of guilt because you know that you are not placing God with your life. And then finally, I'll say, pray. If you believe in God, pray. There is something prayer does for us. It's, for me as a believer, I would, I'm not okay. I'm not supposed to share my personal or practical experience uh, in therapy, but thank God this is not therapy, but there is something prayer does, for, it lightens your burden. It's like sharing what is on you with another person. It, it lightens your burden. It feeds your heart and all that. So if you know how to pray, if you're a child of God, pray. If you're not a child of God, find strength in something. That is, that is what I would say. And so um, I'm sure other ones will come. So let's keep it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senna. That was really insightful. I mean, I've been so blessed already by you know, the solutions you've given us on how to cure or manage depression when we are going through it. So this is when we are going through it. Now, how about if you want to help somebody going through depression? It could be a spouse, a brother, a sister, a child, a colleague at work. How do you help someone who's going through depression? Okay, thank you. So the first one I'll say is gaining 
information or knowledge yourself because without knowledge, you can't help the person. And so um, having had this knowledge here, you want to extend, probably educate the person more. Some people uh, don't have as much knowledge about their condition. And so that alone gets them more depressed. So uh, the best way to help sometimes just educate them more on their situation too. Sometimes all they need is a listening ear, it's a shoulder to cry on, someone to talk to. And, and when they are in their, their bad state or their low state, don't go telling them, get up, do this, you know, try to push them to do. You could just hang around them and offer them a shoulder. I mean, pat them. Uh, sometimes all you have to do there in your home, if they are, is to uh, probably put on some recitals, that positive reinforcement recitals that will encourage them. So here I'm careful not to use Christianity. If the person is a Christian, good. You can put in some songs that we just, I remember I had a, um, a depressed person in my home center and she was a Christian, she believed in God. So all I did every morning when I wake up in the morning, I just, those days were days of cassettes and I just wrote in a cassette or a CD and just keep playing some song. She would sing and sing and sing and I just leave her there with time. Initially, I just couldn't talk to her because she was not in a state uh, to communicate. But with time, she relaxed and then I was able to begin to communicate with her. So sometimes all they need is your presence. Just be around them or sometimes just leave them uh, to be uh, who they want to be. If you can direct them to a professional for help, great. So those are the basic things you can do to support um, amidst many others. But um, that's basically yeah, what you can do. Thank you. Thank you too, Sana. There's someone asking, I the person's name, I hope I'm getting it right. Anting Gani or Anti I don't know which one it is. Um, this person wants to know where we can find help. Where can we find an aspect? Okay, so luckily um, the Ghana Psychological Association of which I'm a member has been fighting for um, hospitals, government to employ professionals at the various hospitals and stuff. And so I know that in most of the major hospitals like Kolebu, Rich Hospital, Lekma, where I was for some time, Lekma Hospital, um, and most of the hospitals, the major hospitals now, 37, yes, 37 is another place. They have psychology units there. And you don't need to pay anything extra to see a psychologist there. You have to just go through the system if you have a national health insurance card. You just have to go through the system like you are sick and coming to the hospital. The doctor will refer you to that unit and you get, you get the help that you need. There are also some private pr practitioners. And so if you contact any member of the Ghana Psychological Association, they will help you uh, referrals to a professional who would, who would help you. And amongst us, we also know people who uh, practice on, on the side. So you just have to contact any of these or go to the hospital, any of these major hospitals. I know some of the private hospitals, I think Nyaho, Nyaho Hospital also um, um, hosts psychologists, their clinical counseling psychologists uh, at their unit. All right, okay. thank you for showing us where we can get help for those of us who live in Ghana. Sana has just showed us that we can contact the public hospitals and then she's also mentioned some private hospitals that we can be in touch with. Is it possible, I see a question here from Emanuela. She says, is it possible for a person to have all the love and support from family and friends and still not feel good about themselves? Yes, it's it's very, very possible. It's very possible because um, like we said, depression. Okay, so I want to assume that the person is not only talking about depression, but generally just not feeling good about themselves. Right? Yes. Okay, 
So I wouldn't say you are depressed if you're just not feeling good about yourself because there should be other symptoms to make me conclude that you are depressed. But not um, feeling good about yourself despite everything that is around you, it's very possible. But you want to, again, subject that thought to questioning, re-evaluation. Why do I feel unloved even when there is so much love around me? And so you want to seek help and, and seek further, but it's very possible to, to, to feel such. Right. Now, Senna, do you think that you can also get relief through deliverance? This is from a purely spiritual perspective. Do you think that from the through deliverance also somebody going through um, depression can get relief? Okay, so um <laughs> this this when it comes to I think that uh, mental health is, is, is a second profession for me. And so the first few questions I asked myself in this field, you know, so when you enter into this field, one of the things you find yourself doing is asking yourself several questions. So counter transference, what we call it, and all that, as to whether you have a mental health disorder and blah, 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 blah. blah. And so I told myself, or oh, I was like, in church, so those days you go to church and the pastor will call. I don't know whether it's still done. I think some churches still do. The pastor will call out and say, if you are here and you have been hearing voices speaking to you, come forward and let me pray to you, or you feel that there's something working through your body. I was like, oh, so this is, could be a symptom of a mental health disorder. So the first place a pastor should refer that person to is possibly to a professional, either a psychiatrist or a psychologist for assistance. If, that, if the professional is done with their work and clears the person and says that, okay, um, I think what you're having it, is not a mental health disorder, then the pastor can take over. You know, because then we can conclude that uh, this goes beyond the scientific. It, it needs spiritual intervention. So, all I'm trying to say is we should be careful when we, it comes to saying I have depression or I have a mental health disorder and I think it's demonic and so I'm going for deliverance. The thing is, you may go for that deliverance, the more you wait and like I have kept sounding, it's just like any other health issue. The longer you delay, the severer it becomes. And so, you keep going to prayer camps for deliverance and it keeps going on. So one time you feel that, yeah, okay, you come back home and another time you relapse and you go back and, and it's because you are looking for spiritual um, solutions. You are worsening the situation if you keep believing that deliverance is what would, would get you out. If you want to go for deliverance, I would advise that do both hand in hand. You seek um professional help and also do your deliverance i do believe that there are things god can do but i also believe that god has also empowered people professionals as instruments that he uses which is also deliverance to some extent and so if you're talking about deliverance here i'm sure you're referring to the spiritual we can do hand in hand and that is what my belief is thank you I thank you very much, Jenna. I'm looking at the questions that we have through our uh, link that we've sent out much earlier on. Yeah. Um, some of the questions have already been answered, thankfully. So I will skip those ones that have been answered. Someone does this direct question. I'll just read it out. It's anonymous. And the sender says, I'm married to a pastor with so many issues in my marriage, from infidelity to disrespect, lack or inadequate communication, cheating, not giving enough money, etc., And the person is worried. What advice do you have for her, Sena? This is, this is something I'll call a full bouquet. <laughs> um, 
so many um, issues at the time. And sometimes when it, it involves the church, uh, it's difficult to know who to talk to because this is a pastor and in our domain in Ghana, pastors wield a lot of power, uh, especially even when it comes to counseling. So for such a person, um, it may be difficult to know who to talk to. I, I hope that she's not found herself in a depressive state even if she hasn't she could find someone to talk to some a trusted person either in church or out of church uh, she could like i said go to the hospital if uh, she may not be sick but there's a psychology in it like as i was at lekma and we had a lot of those cases the marital issues um, like i mentioned marital issues could um, lead to the development of depressive symptoms. And so it's very important that uh, they are handled and handled very carefully. And so she could go to any of this unit. I know LECMA, they are very um, good. Um, at least I was there. They are very good um, professionals there. I know 37 too. They are also very good professionals there. So I want to encourage her to seek help because we, this, is, this platform cannot provide all the help that she needs. So, I want to just encourage her to seek help and it, it, will, it will be well with her. Thank you, Sena. And there's a question that says, it's also anonymous. The person says, what's the difference between being mad and being depressed? Okay, so I want to assume that that person came in late. <laughs> so um, in, in, in actual fact, what we call madness, that is other than can be, um, clearly distinct as madness is schizophrenia. Because with schizophrenia, the person has lost touch with reality. Okay, they have totally lost touch with reality. So those are the people you see on the street who are taking their clothes off, they are unkept. Um, but it has, I have met someone who has schizophrenia, but it's at home and is doing very well. So the thing with this mental health disorders is that if people have social support, very strong social support system. Even with the one we call madness, schizophrenia, they are able to survive, live very healthy lives. And so um, I wouldn't declare anyone mad <laughs> until uh, they have received some form of help or assistance. In Ghana, once we find people exhibiting some deviant behavior, just a little, and we are like, oh, maybe if you know about them, that, that is not bottom. And so madness is when the brain is totally off, totally out, out of touch with reality, then we can say that person is mad. But if not, we can't say the person is mad. Thank you. Great, thank you too. Um, Informa wants to know how to help a, um, a friend or a family member who needs professional help, but is unwilling to seek professional help? Okay, so um, I think like I, I mentioned, a lot of people are in denial of, but some people don't even know that they have depression. That is the thing. Um, and so you have to educate them on the need to see a professional, especially within Africa where mental health still comes with stigmatization. People are willing to seek help. And so you would just want to en encourage the person. So with more education, so if you have acquired education here, you, you know, inform or maybe uh, um, scale it down to the person, try to educate them on the same thing and then let them understand that it, it could get bad. It could get to the severe state. And, and so there's the need to, to seek help. Um, you can't force the person to seek help. So all you have to you can do is to talk to the person. And if the person is willing, then you can direct them to a place to find help. If they are unwilling, uh, I guess there's nothing much you can do. You just keep have to keep encouraging them. Is it possible to bring the professional to see the person? Are there professionals who go to see people in their homes? 
Okay, so uh, GPC, uh, Ghana Psychological Council, will tell you it is unprofessional to go to people's homes, but from places that I have trained and worked, um, professional do go to individual homes. But again, you have to be careful because um, clients that have delusion or uh, hallucinations, they could harm you. And so you have to be careful going to homes. Um, when I came back to Ghana, I think there were a few times um, I was going to people's homes to do therapy, but I had a few experiences. I don't do that anymore. You know? And so some are still willing to go to people's homes to, to render their services. Uh, if you can find those, fine. But either than that, like I mentioned, there are still some, uh, there are still a lot of hospitals now who are providing such services. So you want to take advantage of those. But there, I'm, I'm sure there are people who do home services. Okay, okay. Celia wants to know what she can tell a lady who says she is pregnant, depressed, and wants to abort. Okay, so I'll first of all want to know what the age of that person is. Um, and so, because sometimes if, okay, so again, regardless of the age though, when the pe person is young, of course, they are not ready for that pregnancy. And so maybe they weren't doing some pa, 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 and then the thing locked and then, so they are not ready for, for the pregnancy. They can't stand the shame, they can't stand the humiliation and all that. If it has to, for some for another person, maybe some elderly or adults who doesn't want the pregnancy because maybe they have two or three children already. So the, the, the situation could be different. Depending on what the situation is, uh, you would also uh, determine what to tell the person. But if it is that all things being equal, the person is in a right state of mind, is in a right marriage, is a right pregnancy, but just doesn't want it. It's normal, like we talked about, there is depression that comes with pregnancy. And so here again, education would help that client. I remember there was, again, a lady at the hospital. She was pregnant. She said she didn't want the pregnancy. She wanted to abort. Sometimes when you take them through therapy, they keep that pregnancy. They have the child and they are happy with the child. So again, you would want to um, find out more information, direct them to the appropriate Please for help or maybe, yes, again, find out more. Why do they want to abort and all that? If you know the reason behind it, then you could offer the necessary help, you know, to them. All right, thank you for that answer. The animals can be depressed. Somebody wants to know, Willie T, um, he wants to know if animals also go through depression. Okay, unfortunately, I'm not an uh, animal psychologist, so <laughs> I, I, I can't tell. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I, I can't tell. And I think I didn't have the time to, to research on that to know whether animals do have depression. Uh, but I, I'm sure because most of the medical uh, interventions are first practiced on animals. So, well, maybe, maybe they do, but uh, I can't, unfortunately, I can't provide an answer for that. I'm sorry about that. Sure, sure, sure. That's, that's, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. We've exhausted our questions in the chat. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question? You can raise your hand or you can type it in the comments. Is there an age group that is more vulnerable yes. to depression? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So there is, uh, I saw that question. So age group wise, um, people within the, between Okay, so it's been shown that depression is more, when it comes to gender, okay, so more males are likely to, um, more females, sorry, more females have more de uh, depression than males. But when it comes to suicidal ideations and going through thoroughly suicide, men are more likely to commit suicide than women. And much, may, a lot of women also find relief talking to people compared to men. Uh, when it comes to the age bracket, it's been found that the elderly people between the ages of 60 plus um, are low when it comes to having depression because they are 
they are able to adapt better to life. They have, they now understand life. They are better able to cope. They have more coping skills and all that than the younger people. So between the ages of 20 to let's say 40, depression is more high. Why? It could be attributable to the stresses of life within that age, the responsibilities that uh, we are all exposed to within that age bracket. And so depression is higher within those age brackets. So, so that's, that's it. Right, thanks for that. What are your closing remarks, please, Senna, for all of us as we wrap up our discussion on understanding and overcoming depression? All right, my closing remarks will go two ways. So like from where I came from, professional uh, or psychotherapy, pharmacology, and then again, the, the spiritual. And so if you find yourself having any of the symptoms, so in case you join the, the program late, we have come from outlining the symptoms of depression, but I want to go through and, and state that if you find yourself having emotionally or you are feeling guilty, excessive guilt, uh, excessive worry, you have lost pleasure in the things that you normally would do, you have become more angry or more irritable, you have guilt thoughts, <clears throat> thoughts of wordlessness, hopelessness, you have suicidal thoughts, you have trouble concentration and making decisions, or in severe cases, you are experiencing delusions, hallucinations, and most of these are negative. And then you have lost appetite or you have increased appetite. And because of that, you are either losing weight or gaining weight. You have low activity levels and all that. And this has happened for a certain time duration for like two weeks and beyond. And all these symptoms renders you dysfunctional. Then you are, you are saying that you may be having depression. You don't need all the symptoms to have depression. You need them too. Excessive sadness or worry, and then lots of pleasure in things that were once pleasurable, and then any of the five other symptoms to qualify for diagnosis of depression. And I, and I will emphasize that if you find yourself having any of this, it is not the end of the world. There are people who have had these conditions and they have lived very normal lives. And so seek help. One, go to the hospital if you have to see a professional, you will find help or go to any of the private uh, hospitals. Like I know there's one in Nekma, go there and seek help or find strength in, in your faith in God. We have, I did mention that there are people in the Bible who struggled with depression, but they were able to come through. If you, and I mentioned that if you look at the whole book of Psalm, it chronicles David's moods, the mood swings from high moments to low moments, but David is, it's mentioned at one of the people of faith in the Bible. We also look, talk about Jeremiah. Jeremiah, if you read Lamentation, it tells you that Jeremiah, in fact, Jeremiah is not the weeping prophet. So it also tells you that there is hope for us as Christians. There is hope for you as a child of God. So if you find yourself in a depressed state, don't, whilst you seek professional help, also find your grounding in your faith in God, because he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that we can think or imagine. Those are my concluding words. There's help, so please seek help, and don't crumble in your misery. God bless you. Thank you so much, Sana. It's been a pleasure spending time with you. Thank you all who have joined us. We had a few challenges in the beginning, but by the grace of God, this has happened and we are indeed grateful to God. So this has been brought to you by floodlightsdaily.com. It's a Christian blog. You can find us on the internet, on the World Wide Web. We have um, a YouTube channel and we would load this feed onto the YouTube channel in the course of time so that it becomes accessible to others who would want to listen to the replay. And my closing remarks can be found in Jeremiah 29, 11, which says that, for I know 
the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, there's been a Christian bias on this um, program because it's been organized by a Christian organization. But as Senna mentioned, you can always seek help also from the public hospitals. Many of them now have a psychology unit where psychologists are working and you can just access their professional help with your NHIS card. And we thank God for that. We will take a closing prayer. I see some friends of mine, I think today I'll call someone <laughs> to give us a prayer. <laughs> Kezia, are you there? Please give us a prayer, woman of God. Shall we pray? Amen. Father, we thank you. We give you praise and honor for having brought us this far. Thank you for our sisters who have led the discussion and for their various organizations. Thank you for each and every one of us who joined. Thank you for those of us who are afflicted. Thank you for our family members who have been afflicted. You said you sent forth your word to heal and to deliver. Father, we pray that these lessons we have learned will heal many, deliver many. In the mighty name of Jesus, mm -hmm. we ask for deliverance from every agenda of darkness in the mighty name of Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Depression is not of the Lord. We take authority in the blood of Jesus. Mm. And we destroy every agenda of darkness concerning any life connected to this program and connected to us who are not even here. That Lord, mm. by this program, there will be massive explosion of deliverance. Nobody will take their lives. Nobody will continue to walk in rejection, depression, mm. and every related problems in the mighty name of Jesus. Every stronghold of the enemy that touches mm. any life, touches any mind by our agreement, by the blood of Jesus. We scatter that stronghold right now in the mighty name of Jesus. As we go mm. to sleep, we pray mm. that Lord God Almighty, you will brood over every life, brood over every home. Send help, oh God Almighty. Deliver us from shyness. Deliver us from the spirit of feeling that, oh, if we tell someone, they will know about our problem. Father, deliver us from all those things. Deliver us from fear of gossip and all those other related matters that are making us hide and keep suffering. And Lord God Almighty, help us so that in this last quarter, we'll live our best lives to your glory. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless floodlight, continue to bless my sisters, especially the person who led us this evening, Senna. I pray that, Lord, any area of her life where she needs your intervention, visit her because she has ministered to us tonight. Let all the glory go to you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' awesome name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Katie, Amen. for that. And God bless you. Thank you for the Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. It's a wrap. Have a good night. I see you all.